Good afternoon to you viewers, this is the Colonel speaking to you live from the Grange for British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. Today we've got another of the Columbia Educational Records. This is Lecture 89, Part 3 and 4 of Sound. What is sound? Oh no it isn't. Oh yes it is, yes it is, sorry viewers. Part 3 and 4. Uh, spoken by Sir William Bragg, Fellow of the Royal Society. Here we go. Sound can be carried by water and other liquids, as well as by solids, when two boats are close together. It is easy for those who are in one to hear blows on the hull of the other, the sound tremors being carried by the water. It's possible to send communications in this way. That sound can be carried by gases, such as the air, is of course our common experience. Sound can it pass through a vacuum, however? It requires something material to carry it, solid, liquid, or gas. Between us and the sun, there is space, empty of gas or air or any substance. No sound can travel across such a space. Light, on the other hand, travels quite easily. Light and our eyes that see deal with the doings of the whole universe. Sound belongs to the world only. I may talk of the universe of light, but I can only talk of the world of sound. As soon as you understand that sound is a quivering motion which goes from one place to another, you will realize that most likely it takes a certain time to make the journey, and so it does. When, for example, a sound travels through the air, it takes nearly five seconds to go a mile. And it is a very important thing that all sorts of sound, shrill whistles and deep boomings, take just the same amount of time to travel. If a band is playing a long way away, you hear all the instruments keeping time correctly with each other, piccolo and cornet and drum, no matter how far away they are. If some sounds traveled more quickly than others, you would only be able to hear music properly when you were quite close to it. It's a very common thing to find examples of the fact that sound takes time to travel. If you are standing on one side of a valley and you watch a train approach a station a mile or two away on the other side, you may notice when the steam first issues in a white cloud from the whistle as the engine driver gives warning that he's coming. And light travels so fast that you see the steam practically on the instant that the engine driver opens his whistle. But it may be many seconds before you hear it. I have often watched the woodcutters at work in Australia where the clear still air makes it easy to see and hear at long distances. From one side of a wide gully, I've seen the strokes of the axe fall noiselessly far away on the other side. And then, when the man has straightened himself and begun to move away, the noise of the blows has reached my ears. If you watch a long procession going along a street, marching to the music that heads it. Every man puts his foot down at the beat of the drum, but of course the rear ranks do not hear it as soon as the front ranks, so that really they do not march in step. If you look sharply, you will see a ripple run along the line as the heads go up and down slightly to the movement of the feet. As the pulses go to greater and greater distances from their source, they spread over wider and wider surfaces and become weaker. The farther away the source of sound is from the listener, the feebler it seems to be. But if we wish to do so, we can prevent the sound from spreading itself over wide surfaces. Right on side two, viewers. I don't know about you, but I could hear that chap's uh, false teeth um, uh, clicking slightly. 
rather unfortunate. But there we go. Part four, here we go. If we prevent the sound from spreading, it will then carry much farther. As, for example, when we use speaking tubes, which carry the sound pulses with little loss for quite considerable distances. The walls of the tubes inside ought to be smooth because if they are not, the rubbing of the air against the walls as it moves to and fro when the quivers pass over it spoils the true shape of the waves, turning them into little whirlpools in which the energy is wasted. Moreover, there must be no sharp corners, no right angles in the tubes, because at a corner some of the sound is reflected and goes back the way it came. When a man uses a speaking trumpet, he does something of this kind also, because the trumpet tends to direct the sound in the way the speaker wants it to go. But the action of the speaking trumpet depends more on the fact that the speaker can actually get a greater amount of sound out of his own throat. You feel that you're working harder when you are using one. The rigid walls of the trumpet do not allow the sound waves to spread sideways very readily and, in a sense, hold them for the vocal organs to work on. The tremors of sound in the air spread away from the source in the way that waves spread in the sea, and they can turn a corner just as sea waves can. In fact, they are waves, waves in the air. But there is a limit to what they can do in this respect. Obstacles that are much wider than the waves are long, can hold up the sound wave and cast a sound shadow, just as there is a sheltered lee behind an island. But a small rock casts no appreciable shadow of the ocean swell. In the same way, sound sweeps round and over small obstacles so that we hear round a corner to a very useful extent. As we turn a corner from one street into another, we are aware that we've left many sounds behind us. They've been cut off by the corner building. This is especially true of high-pitched sound, so that the dull roar of city traffic follows us down the side street, even when we've lost the sharper sounds that make the characteristics of the various kinds of noises. And when, on a country walk, we come to the top of a hill, we can hear the brook that is running in the next valley, though formerly we've been in the sound shadow cast by the top of the hill. The shadow is often quite sharp because the pitch of the brook sound is high. To conclude, the answer to the question, what is sound, may be stated very simply. We want to learn as much as we can of what is going on in the material world round about us. Now, nothing can take place without starting tremors or quiverings, and in particular, quiverings in the air. Our ears are organs adapted for the detection and interpretation of the quivering. The quiverings are sound, and our detection of them is hearing. Sound in one form of wave motion the waves on the surface of the sea are another. The analogy between them is so strong that the behavior of the water waves, which we can see, helps us to understand the laws of the sound waves which we hear, but do not see. Well, there we go, viewers. That was uh, recorded around 1928. Um, and of course it was just before that sort of time, around 1926-27, that Percy Wilson was uh, writing down the mathematical formulae uh, to provide us with giant horns like this one for acoustic uh, recording. Um, because, um, you know, this is a mathematical horn, this is exponential. Which uh, You can look that up, viewers. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, viewers, and goodbye. <laughs>